Thanks for us for tuning in. Today, Stefan Arstall joined us, the founder of Tower Beach Club, the author of The Five Hour Workday. He's doing some amazing things in San Diego. We're right in the heart of Mission Bay. Doesn't get much more San Diego than this. We talk all about his stand up paddleboard company, the e bike commerce market. Let's check it out. Thanks so much for tuning into Waz Up San Diego. Today I'm joined by Stefan Arstall, the founder of Tower, as seen on Shark Tank, was backed by Mark Cuban. Uh, that was back in 2004? 2012. 2012. Wow, yep. time flies. Time. Um, and he's doing some very exciting things here in San Diego. So thank you so much for joining us today. Hey, thanks for having me on, Luke. Absolutely. Appreciate so, you know, you kind of got your start. Um, we were deep diving a little bit, went to UCSD. Graduated, worked for some USD. company. USD, USD excuse USD, me. Yeah, yeah. USD, I always say UCSD. <laughs> uh, worked kind of in the biz development for radiology. And then, you know, what got you into tower paddle boards? Well, you know, I was I started in the internet space straight yes. out of uh, grad school. And then I started a company called buypokerchips.com in okay. 2003. So that's really where I learned the online uh, space. Um, and that it was, it was like a booming industry. The poker chips went on, or poker was on TV. So that was sort of a boom and bust business, and then I had to find something else. Gotcha. So then in 2010, I pivoted and uh, started um, Tower Paddleboards, which was you know direct to consumer paddleboards, half the price of retail paddleboards, and uh, you know that really took off, and uh, you know, that's where we are today. Awesome. And then uh, obviously on Shark Tank too as well. We're backed by Mark Cuban, and how did that kind of help you know the business explode and grow? Yeah, so I'm known as the worst pitch in the history of Shark Tank. <laughs> that still landed a deal because I went on there and just like forgot my lines and like froze and they called me a nerd and a leprechaun and it was, it was pretty bad. But uh, I came back and ended up getting a deal from uh, Mark Cuban and that was, he was a guest shark on that season. So this was one of the first seasons he was on and so we were one of his early deals. Um, and since then, I mean, it was kind of a rough start, but since then we've gone on to become his uh, best investment in the history of the show. Wow. And we're one of the top five or top 10 uh, investments in the show, you know, all together. Wow, awesome. So it's, uh, we've done about 36 million in sales over about nine years period. Um, and uh, we, we bootstrapped it. Largely, he only put in 150,000. Uh, we didn't advertise for the first four years. So we really just sort of rolled up our sleeves and. Uh, and build a paddleboard business. And I know that's one thing you said too, is you know keeping your burn rate as low as possible. How did you kind of keep that lean machine going and what were some of the tactics you employed? Well, I mean, that's something that I sort of learned from Cuban. This is one of the, the biggest lessons because early on it was, we were just growing so fast. We were constantly out of inventory and, mm -hmm. you know, and I'm just like, you know, Mark, like give me a million dollar line of credit. We'll just <laughs> blow this thing up, you know, right away. And he was always like, you know, quit worrying about the upside. He's like, worry about your downside, worry about going to zero. Love it. And, um, you know, I was like, well, I have nothing to lose. So I'm, I don't care about my downside. Um, but I've learned in a lot of areas of the business that that is, very, that is the correct approach. And now the paddleboard industry has uh, declined a little bit in the last couple of years. And we've had a retraction. And, you know, if, unless you're very conservative, uh, those things can sort of catch you by surprise. Even us, it's caught us by surprise a little bit. But I experienced the same thing in the, uh, in the poker chip industry. And so, about two years ago when I realized, okay, this thing is sort of flattened out, it's starting to decline, there's more competition, there's more price pressure, um, we diversified. Mm -hmm. and we went into, you know, this, what we're in here today is actually a cost cutting measure, the, the Tower Beach Club. This is an event venue. Um, so, you know, we basically rent it by the month and then rent it out for, you know, weddings and corporate events uh, by the day. And, you know, it's profitable just as is. And then we do pop-up retail in here when there's not an event going on. So instead of paying rent, we collect rent. Um, and so that keeps our costs like less than zero, right? Yes. For, for our retail space, which is actually, so and our offices, revenue. our offices are in the back here tucked away. So that's free for us. Um, and that is a huge advantage as you get into an industry um, that starts to shake up like the paddleboard industry is doing right now. So that's a protection measure. And that is something, you know, I basically learned from Cuban. How do you, how do you get your burn rate low? How do you get your burn rate negative? Mm -hmm. And, you know, diversifying into other businesses. Um, and then part of the diversification, we also went into uh, electric bikes. Um, that's a huge growth market. 
Um, and we, we've done another site called uh, nomailman.com, which is sort of an aggregation of all the greatest direct-to-consumer brands in the world. One place consumers can go online and shop for all of the you know, Warby Parkers, Harry's Racers, all the coolest brands out there in one spot. Wow. And so this just, we just covered so many things right yes. now. So, so Tower Beach Club, this is an amazing venue right on the water where people can come in here, rent it by the day, as you said, the month. Um, Look okay, at you got San Diego <laughs> Bay right there. You, you don't have to go to you know a hotel where you're paying fifty to hundred dollars a plate and twelve dollar drinks. Like this is spectacular. Yeah, I mean that's really what we wanted to do here. Is we have you know it's it's, it's a rare sort of waterfront venue, mm -hmm. two hundred and seventy degree view. The view is just crazy here. It is. And um, we we just ran out the room, so you can bring in your own booze, you can bring in your own food, so you can do a very cost effective event here. Yep. Um, and and it works you know great for us too because we our, our products are kind of like our surfboards and skateboards and you know bikes are sort of like artwork throughout the space. So you get this sort of beach vibe as well. Exactly. Because so it's, it's a the very lifestyle, San Diego like, type event venue. I love it. Um, but it's brand introductions for us. So we did a party here last summer and we just opened. Um, so. Like this summer, like, you know, we've got five or six bookings. It's the calendar is wide open for people mm -hmm. looking to book. But like last summer, we did a party for HP. There were 1,400 people here. They took wow. over the whole lawn out there. Um, you know, Plus, and they the, had this. your deck is ridiculous. It's, yeah. it's huge. Yeah. So all 1,400 people weren't in here at the same time. <laughs> yeah. um, but you Fire can do early. a big event with the water and with the, uh, you know, the neighboring park. So it's a, it's a really cool, you know, corporate space that's, that's very, very much a San Diego vibe. Absolutely. Love it. And then let's dive into the, the e-bikes too as well. We were kind of talking a little bit before the show about just the market, where it's headed. Um, you know, you have that infrastructure from what you did with the paddle boards to, you know, just replace the product with the, an e-bike. Where do you see it going? And tell me a little bit about that. Yeah. So when we started the paddleboard company in 2010, the paddleboard market was growing at like 100% a year. I wow. mean, just breakneck pace. There were 80 um, paddleboard companies in there. And when I went on to Shark Tank, one of the reasons it was a flop is because I went in there and I said, I'm going to start a paddleboard company. We got 80 competitors. And they, and, uh, and they said, well, do you have any IP? What, you know, what do you have? I have nothing. <laughs> we have a brand. We're good at, uh, at getting um, basically leads for free on the internet. And so we basically created one of the top brands in the, in the paddleboard market. We're a top five brand uh, today um, in a very crowded market. If we look at today, um, the e-bike market is absolutely exploding. In mm -hmm. 2018, in the U.S., there were 300,000 e-bikes sold. Um, in, by 2030, that's supposed to be 7 million a year. Right. So, so 20X. that's 20x. It's 20x growth in a period of, of 10 years. Wow. And in the, the worldwide market, it's, it's much bigger in Europe. And in Asia, where they see bikes as sort of transportation, the transition to e-bikes was a very natural one for them. Mm -hmm. But in the U.S., bikes are not considered transportation. But once you have uh, an electric bike that has an 80-mile range, all of a sudden it starts to dawn on people. Like you can buy this thing for a thousand, two thousand bucks. Um, you can get rid of your car for a beach town like this. It's, Absolutely. This is like great transportation. You don't have to worry about parking. You don't have mm -hmm. to worry about traffic. It's like faster to get places on an e-bike and you got the wind in your hair. So this is sort of the realization that the U.S. is coming to right now and that's why you're seeing this breakneck growth. I mean the worldwide industry is growing at a breakneck pace for e-bikes. But in the U.S. market it's, it's basically hyper growth. There's maybe a couple hundred brands that are doing this. But if you ask most consumers in the U.S., 99% uh, of consumers, they can't name an e-bike brand. Name, I can't name an e-bike brand. It's a complete brand void. So. For us, this is perfect because it's exactly like paddle boards were. We've mm -hmm. done this before, um, you know, we've proven it. So, but it's a bigger opportunity and e-bikes are quite a bit more expensive to, to inventory and develop. Um, so we're, we're actually looking to raise about $10 million right now to really take this from, you know, Tower from a startup brand to really like a, a very large brand, basically. It can be very impactful, you know, and of course in e-bikes, we're doing beach cruisers. You know, mm -hmm. we're very niche oriented. We're, we're we're playing off of this sort of the beach lifestyle. And uh, the, the beach cruiser is one of the you know, most popular bikes out there anyways. Absolutely, and especially uh, around here too as well in yeah. San Diego. Wow, so how do you kind of plan on, you know, becoming that brand, becoming kind of that main, what, do you have any tactics that, you know, worked great with Tower and how were you creating that brand? I mean, it's, it's, it's really pretty, pretty simple. Uh, you, you basically got to focus on your product. And you've got to create the, we live in such a transparent world today that if you build the best product Absolutely. and the best value proposition. So like you can build a great product and you can sell it in retail, but people are paying this sort of retail markup. 
But if you make an incredible product and really focus on making an incredible product and having incredible customer service and then sell it direct to consumer, mm -hmm. you can do it for half price. Um, so that's what we did in paddle boards. And it took a few years because our prices were so low in paddle boards that people didn't take us seriously. Just because they, they thought it was an inferior product just it was based an off inferior of price. Product. Which I, um, I mean, it, today it's a very transparent world in the product uh, world. So if you make basically the best quality product, the best design product, mm -hmm. and make it uh, you know, findable, uh, people will find that you know, over time. And you, you don't even have to advertise that much to do that because word of mouth sort of spreads. Um, you know, that's how we, what we focused on in the paddleboard market. But then also we applied that a direct to consumer model. So we were okay. selling for half price of retail. So it's not just a great product, but it's a great value proposition. Absolutely. And so this is, uh, you know, it's, it's a basic formula and that's the same formula that we're using in e-bikes. Um, in the paddleboard market, we had sort of a, a problem the first couple of years because our prices were so low that people didn't take our product seriously. They thought we were an online uh, like discounter. Yep. They didn't understand that this was basically the same product as you were you know, you were paying twice. Because you were so new to the game with that business model too, I'm sure, because yeah, there wasn't a lot of nobody knew the consumer. brand. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, and the, the online space was quite a bit different then too. Direct to consumer mm -hmm. was kind of a, a newer thing. Because this was then. 2010 to 2010. 2012 era. Okay. Even today, people, most consumers don't understand direct to consumer. They think of direct to consumer like the uh, you know, furniture store that's doing a going out of business sale, or they say direct to consumer. That's not really direct to consumer. Yeah. Um, even like, oh, you can go to Nike and you can buy from Nike direct through their website. They think that's direct to consumer. But what direct to consumer is, is direct to consumer only. So you opt out of all other retail mm -hmm. and that allows you to establish your prices basically at wholesale to the consumer. Um, if you sell somewhere else, but also direct to consumer, you basically just make more margin on anything you sell direct. So Nike kills it on their direct stuff because they're selling yeah, you know, $100 sure. sneakers that they make for five bucks that they could sell direct to consumer for 15 bucks. Because the wholesalers are getting their piece, then the sales guys are getting their piece, and then everybody is just adding on to it. And then when they do buy direct from that website, it's just yeah. killing it. So, yeah, so they make a ton of money. So just brands are just killing it in their sort of direct sales if they're retail brands. But what's happening in the entire uh, consumer packaged good industry mm -hmm. is an upstart company. Like there's a shoe company called Allbirds, which you know just sells really high quality shoes you know, at basically half price. And they dominate, and they also have better customer service because, if, like in the paddleboard industry, if you try to call one of the traditional brands, you can't get them on the phone. You go into the store. If that retail store isn't already out of business, they they don't even know anything about your product. If yeah. you go to a Dick Sporting Goods or something, they don't know anything they have no about idea. that. You want to take it back? They really can't help you. I mean, if they call us, I pick up the phone sometimes. So it's this direct connection. So that's what really would happen in the paddleboard industry. What people finally realized after a few years. We had you know, one of the a very top quality product. We had a better um, value proposition and our customer service was actually superior, superior. because you could reach us. Um, so that's really uh, how the world is changing. And mm -hmm. that's why direct to consumer brands across the, uh, you know, the gamut of different product categories are really taking over. So do you see that niche growing a lot more in the future too as well? Yeah. Because now that Amazon, you know, too as well, everybody's on there. And t typically people would think you gotta be on there because they, Command so much attention. On Amazon. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And Amazon was a big part of Tower's initial growth. And we weren't on Amazon the first uh, two or three years. Mm -hmm. uh, but then we went on Amazon and it was maybe 2013. And we saw incredible growth on Amazon. Um, and so we were doing, you know, half of our sales on Amazon. Wow. Um, there was a time where you could be profitable on Amazon and do that. But Amazon is kind of like, you know, uh, you've got the tiger by the tail. You know they're going to eat you at some point. So what's happened on Amazon the last couple of years is it's hard to be profitable. You can drive a ton of sales on Amazon, but a lot of companies today that are showing these huge revenue numbers that are selling through Amazon mm -hmm. are not making any money. And this is sort of the dirty little secret of what's going in the, on in the online space right now. So about uh, two years ago, we, we saw this. And we were, you know, our regular business was making healthy margins in Amazon sales because you not only had to be on Amazon and give them their, you know, 25%, you had to then advertise on Amazon and give them another, you know, 15 oh, for like the sponsored or 25%. Ads that are on there. So all of a sudden you're paying a 50% margin to sell on Amazon. Wow. Which is back to retail. So today Amazon is basically a convenience store. Stuff is not cheapest on Amazon. If you want the best product um, and the best value proposition, it's these direct to consumer brands. So, so interesting. We've actually started a, a separate site called nomiddleman.com. Mm -hmm which has aggregated all of these direct-to-consumer brands onto one site. So you can go in there, 
and shop and say, I want to get you know, women's shoes, and I'll show you here's all the direct-to-consumer brands that you should consider, and very curated, where on Amazon you go look at women's shoes and you'll find 15,000 pairs of shoes with you know, 5,000 fake reviews on this shoe, and you, it's really become the wild, wild yeah. west. Um, we're offering sort of curation and aggregation of these direct-to-consumer brands, and that's, that's just sort of a side project that uh -huh. we think is potentially sort of the, the antidote to Amazon. And it's probably five years or ten years from really taking off until consumers, you know, understand what's going on here. But we're just sort of letting that marinate in the background. But that could be a billion-dollar company. At some point. Yeah, that's so fascinating too. So like the Harry's razors and like the Kylie Jenner's makeups and tower paddle boards and the e-bikes, everything like yeah, that. Yeah, right it's now all we have about four hundred brands wow. that are on there uh, in about I think about twenty-three hundred categories. There's maybe three or four thousand categories on on the website. Um, but yeah, and there's there's new ones growing every day. And the, the top 25 direct to consumer brands have raised over two and a half billion dollars. Two and a half billion. So there's there's the VC money is throwing a ton into this because they really are disrupting uh, you know consumer packaged goods in mm -hmm. a big way. Do you see you know some of the bigger retailers kind of combating that somehow at all? Well, I mean, retailers got a lot of a lot of things to worry about right now. Yeah. Um, you've got Amazon, uh -huh. um, and then you've got these direct to consumer brands. And some of the, the direct-to-consumer brands started direct-to-consumer and then they've sort of gone into retail. Like a Harry's Razors is a good example. Mm -hmm. Or a Casper Mattresses, I think they sell like one mattress in like Target or something like that. But, um, so there's shake-up in the retail space. I mean, some of the retailers are doing really good. Costco is doing really good because it's very curated products. Yeah, it is. And um, it's, it's, it's really kind of different than what you find on Amazon. So in the age of Amazon, Costco is doing very well. You know, Walmart and, and Target are hanging around. I mean, the rest of you know retail is really dying off, and then you have these sort of thousand points of light of these direct to consumer companies that are really taking you know big chunks, and that's that's kind of why we're raising money for the e-bike company, because you've got an e-bike market, a huge growing market, with a brand void. I mean, there's going to be big big winners there. Yeah, absolutely. If you can establish yourself as one of the, the top brand, top three brands in there, that's that's massive. And it's, it's a well. transportation category. This is not like paddle boards. We're a little bit of a trend. Poker yeah. chips were certainly a trend. Uh, paddle boards were a little bit of a trend that, that grew fast and then sort of you know, tailored off as people are on to the, what's the next mm -hmm. activity they're gonna do. Transportation doesn't disappear. Once no. transportation takes over, you know, that's a sustainable category. And the trend right now too is people want to live closer to work. They want that more urban walkability lifestyle. Um, and if you're able to, hey, it's not walkable, but it's an easy e-bike ride to where I don't have to get all hot and sweaty to go into the office and then go take a shower before starting work. Oh, that's massive. Yeah, I mean, transportation is changing. You've got Uber coming in. You've got these little uh, scooter shares everywhere. Mm -hmm. You've got the bike shares. You've got personal electrical vehicles, by, like you know, uh, electric bikes. It's really going to make, I think, uh, cities like a lot more livable. Mm -hmm. I mean, if, if half the cars disappear, and then you've got the whole eco element of mm -hmm. it. You know, the, a lot of cars going to electric. Uh, for me, I mean, this is this is all exciting. In San Diego, I think we're we're ideally positioned for this. We've got one of the biggest bike markets in the country. Over 1.1 million San Diegans regularly ride a bike out wow. of the you know the, the larger San Diego area, about a little over three million people. So that's, that's a the third. What's that? That's, that's a third. That's a third. Yeah, in the park. because wow. we're very active. I mean, the weather is incredible year round here. It's not like we're in Minnesota where there's snow on the ground half yeah. the time. So you can ride a bike year round, and because of that. We have this whole network of uh, bike trails in San Diego. Like, there's a 24-mile circuit around San Diego Bay, um, there around Mission Bay. Here, there's like a 14-mile, you know, dedicated bike lanes. And there's just a few places where you have to jump off and do um, some kind of a street, like mm -hmm. with a bike lane. Um, you've got, the, you know, three miles of the boardwalk out here. So there's this network of sort of thoroughfares for personal electric vehicles. That if we just connect in San Diego, we can have one of the most livable. Um, cities in the country and what, what one of the problems is that these uh, these scooter shares have kind of scared people I mean they dropped them and they were everywhere yeah. like overnight I, I remember watching the documentary yeah. where they would just come into a city and drop them off and let's see what happens and crazy people picked them up within a week or two weeks um, and I think it's change and people got scared of that change and they're talking about outlawing um, these scooters and electric bikes now on the boardwalk mm -hmm. and I think that's like a very short-sighted uh, you know way but that's kind of what how cities react sometimes yeah so there will be this sort of process it's just the fear of how do we control it this is it seems like a solution but long term it's not especially for growing that trend towards e-bikes e-transportation etc yeah i think you've got to develop 
you know, more pathways. And we just happen to be so fortunate because we have all these, all these uh, like boardwalk lined waterways in San Diego mm -hmm. that we already have the infrastructure for electric vehicles and electric bikes. We connect a few of those. We have the most livable city and, you know, half the cars will disappear in San Diego. Absolutely. I think a lot of these millennials are not even buying cars. <laughs> <laughs> I went, and there's so many places you don't need one. And if you have to go visit, you know, a friend who lives in a different part of the county, hop on an Uber, or a lot of people have cars too as well. Plus like the new MTS that's coming through, that's going, you know, all the way, you know, through Bay Park and up, et cetera. Yep. Uh, it's becoming a lot more friendly yep. in regards to that. So. so tell me, what are some of your favorite spots kind of in San Diego? What made you kind of land here, stay here? choose PB, Mission Beach as, sure. you know, the hub. Yeah, I mean, at my age, I get a lot of crap for living in PB, but I, uh, I moved from Seattle, so it's yep. you know, very rainy up there. And I lived in Hawaii for a while, so I got addicted to the nice weather. And then I came through, uh, and I basically traveled the country looking for the coolest place in America to live. And it was a, it was a road trip from Seattle down the coast <laughs> all the way to Key West. And it, it came down to between uh, here and Fort Lauderdale. And I ended up choosing San Diego. It was a little easier flight home. I like the more Southern California vibe. Um, but if I'm living here, I have to live at the beach. So yeah. I, I just think it's crazy. Like I can go get a you know, big house way inland, but I would prefer you know a shack at the beach. <laughs> That's my mentality. So I really love the the PB community, and uh, I mean it's very young, so there's a lot of activity. Um, you know, I, I have no problem. Friends want to come visit all the time, and then they're like, "Well, why do you live in an apartment on the beach?" And I'm like, "Well, you guys come here visit all the time." Yeah, it's <laughs> and it's so central. It makes here you feel too like you're well. on vacation all the Absolutely. time. Absolutely. Because I have friends spread out all over. You know, some friends are in Cardiff, and some are farther south, and some are inland. And like, this is just kind of that meeting kind of spot where it's just it's so close. Yeah, yeah. yeah so I and I love it, and it. it I mean, this is why I created a you know, beach lifestyle business, because this is the kind of lifestyle I enjoy. And you know, that allows us to create a very authentic uh, you know, tower brand here of everything. You know, and with e-bikes, we're, we're doing beach cruisers. You know, we're a very niche part of the e-bike, and we think we can uh, you know, dominate that and then maybe grow from there. Absolutely. Well, I love it. So thank you so much for taking the time to uh, sit down and chat with me. If anybody wants to connect with you, uh, how should they follow you on you know, social media, online? Um, well, the easiest, our social media, most social media is at Tower Beach Club, okay. that's sort of our main brand, and that encompasses uh, Tower Electric Bikes, uh, Tower Paddle Boards, Tower Beach Club event space, okay. um, and then you can go to those websites, just you know, TowerElectricBikes.com, TowerPaddleBoards.com. We're very easy to find. Um, if you search paddle boards, you're going you're gonna to find us. Perfect. So, well, and all it. of our email stuff is on there, so we're very reachable. Love it. Well, thanks again. Um, thank you so much for tuning in to Waz Up San Diego, and I will see you next week. Such an amazing episode with Stefan Arstall. So grateful to have him on the show. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out anytime, and see you next time.